We are here today at a global tourism conference which involves a former US president, a Hollywood actress, the great and good of tourism. I'm getting the impression that everyone is thinking that tourism is only, only a force for good and can actually almost be a panacea. Is, is that what you think? Well, it is a force for good and that's something that ought to be, ought to be remembered. But like any grand human activity, it has its good side and it has its bad side. And uh, what we're here for is to upstage the good side and uh, also remind ourselves that there are consequences and be responsible about it. With growth and power, which its industry has come to acclaim, comes responsibility. And I don't think we can separate the two things from one another. Is growth inevitable and always good, sustainable growth? Is it inevitable and always good? Now you come from the, from the non-business side, right? you're the governmental side, these people here are all business people. It's possibly in their interest to carry on growing. What's your view on this? I think when you qualify it and describe it as sustainable growth, yes, it is good. It is good and it's inevitable. People were always asking me the question when I talk about how uh, much tourism has grown. Will tourism always grow? And it's, is it always good for it to grow? So my answer is, when we talk about economic indicators, do we always ask the question, should an economy grow or not? If the answer is yes, then tourism is and has to grow. And I don't see that growth and sustainability are contradicting each other. It's not a zero-sum game at all. We can have growth and we can have sustainability and responsibility at the same time. This is what we hope to be doing. But we are at the moment in a situation where, quite, I suggest a quite precarious situation, where you have a massive emerging market uh, in terms of China, in terms of the number of tourists coming out of China. Um, we're talking about, I think, we've already hit the billion mark in terms of total tourists. We're talking two billion, not so far away. Oh, now, can the world deal with that, that number of tourists? Well, indeed, China and many other developing countries now have become very prominent tourism players. China, this year, this last year, 2012, we just closed the records on, became number one in the world, out uh, going out down facing uh, Germany, which has for a long, long period of time been the one. 18 million travelers came out of China. Now, uh, we had 1 billion, 35 million this last year, and we're expecting 1.8 billion by 2030, which is close to 2 billion. Will uh, this growth continue to be the trend? Yes. It would not be at the same rates as it is going on now. It will slow down, but growth will always be a phenomenon. The higher the nominal value, the lower the, the great ratios uh, will become. Is it good or not? Indeed it is good. You know, travel, tourism today, is not just another activity. It's, and it's not even a human need, it has become a human right. I think the more people that travel around the world, the better this world can become. I'm a better person because I travel. We are better people because we travel. And I don't see any, uh, any cap on that, that we should do. Today, we have one out of seven of the people of the world traveling, making an international trip once a year. That's tremendous. This is a revolution by two cents, and I don't think there is any stop. But when you look at a continent like Africa, for instance, where, in a sense, I think tourism is being sold as the answer to an awful lot of problems. It's labor-intensive. There are lot, you know, lots of undiscovered potential there. Nonetheless, it does, the arrival of tourism does impose some very difficult issues. It almost imposes the, the obligation to have tourism in, in some of these countries. What, what do you worry about? Tell me, please tell me that much. Well, Africa is a very, very special situation. But the future is tourism, on all levels. And tourism is in the forefront of this future. But your question really should be addressed in, in it's, it's like, what comes before what? Is it, it's the classical chicken and egg question. Yes, tourism demands certain requirements that are being now being placed on Africa and, and, and pushing Africa to do that. But Africa has to do that anyhow, whether there was tourism or not. So it creates the motive for doing what ought to be done anyhow, and at the same time it caters for the, for the, for the tourism industry. But tourism brings in multinational corporations. Tourism involves leakage quite often. In other words, you know, an awful lot of money going straight out of the continent back to other countries. 
um, it can involve uh, local communities being disrupted. These are big, big That's issues. That's why you have UNWTO. This is what our mandate is, is to promote sustainability in tourism and make sure that it does not end up becoming destructive to the community, to the environment, to the culture, or to the economic uh, firmness of, of the distribution of the, uh, of the revenues. That's why we're there to remind people, to set guidelines, criteria, and all kinds of incentives, motives, and research and study to show that yes, growth, but not the way that it ends up disrupting all of these systems. Which is fine in a conference like this, with where everyone can pay lip service to it, but when it comes to actually monitoring... We're doing it on the ground. Sure, that's what I'm going to ask you. In terms of monitoring and actually having teeth to say to governments and whoever, look, slow down or don't do this. Have, can you do that? Of course we're doing it in open We've introduced in the last three years a very, very interesting concept called sustainability observatories in tourism. These observatories are designed to monitor the environmental impact, the social impact, and the economic impact. They're permanent setups that keep generating data every day on what is the impact, what is it doing. On an environmental level, we have almost perfected it. We have five sustainability observatories uh, in China. We just opened one in, in Greece, and we're doing another one in Andorra. And we're planning for two in Africa. So these are some of the tools that we're applying on the ground. And don't forget that as a UN organization, we deal with the countries on bilateral level, one by one, every day. So it's not just talking about the issue, it's doing things on the ground. One last question. People watching this might slightly raise their eyebrows at a conference looking at sustainability based in Abu Dhabi. They may think that in the past Abu Dhabi has not had a perfect record when it comes to that situation. Are you happy about hosting, having a conference here? I disagree with people that look at development like this and, this and say that this is anti-sustainability. The, the point is, was this a more beautiful, more enjoyable and more uh, uh, attractive and good place before all this development or not. I don't see development as anti-sustainability at all. I think Dubai is a success story, Abu Dhabi is a success story, the Emirate is a success story, and the more they become conscious of their responsibility, the more they can perfect investing their resources into what is right and what is good. I don't think that we should judge people unfairly just because there are high rises. I mean, who said that high rise, a high rise is anti-sustainability? That's not true. And what about golf courses that involve an awful lot of desalination and, and usage of water supplies? What about that? Well, you know, you can you can look at all of these details and judge them one by one. But the point is this: we are desalinating water. We need to desalinate water. This part of the world always will depend on that. So uh, I don't see this as different from any other need that needs to be catered for uh, in a society like this. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you. Well done. Thank you.